call to order the uh, April 7, 2015 meeting of the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners. And we will start, as always, with the Pledge of Allegiance. you'll join me in prayer. <clears throat> God, we're humbled by another day, another hour, another moment of life in the most beautiful place in the world. We're fascinated by the unfolding spring and the perfect harmony of nature as the seasons change. Place your hand of comfort on families who have lost loved ones in senseless acts of violence, terrorism, or thoughtlessness. Put your cloak of safety on the 200 local firefighters who have been battling fires in Ridgecrest and other parts of our county. Bless their families as they sacrifice and offer up these fine young men and women to help us fight fires. Put a blanket of healing on all people who are sick, depressed, ailing, or in the last chapters of their life. Make them comfortable and upbeat despite their infirmities. Place a level of wisdom and vision on the members of the State Department and, co and Congress members as they consider plans for peace and disarming nuclear capabilities. Give all our representatives the right direction on this complicated issue. And help our commissioners and other local officials to ponder decisions in a balanced and fair manner that leads to justice and prosperity for all our residents. And most of all, help us to appreciate what a fantastic opportunity we each have to make the world a better place. You made each one of us special and unique. Help us to uncover and understand our individual offerings to each other. Amen. <coughs> In accordance with our code of ethics adopted by the County Commission, we all have a duty to obey all laws uh, concerning official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid improprieties in the exercise of our official duties and to faithfully perform the duties of the office and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and public manner. Is there any item on the agenda, the outcome of which will have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Also, does any board member have any financial interest in the public contracts that might come before the board today? Hearing none, I, I find there are no board members that have such conflicts, and as such, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote. The next matter of business we're going to take up is public comment. <coughs> the, uh, we are going to have, I will say that we have public hearings, so you'll have a chance to have public comments closer at the time we make decisions for the Ferry Road property acquisition and the zoning request at 31 Monticello Road. So I would ask that if you do have comments on those that you wait until our public hearing and then it will be closer in the time that we're going to consider it. The time limit for comments to the board is three minutes. If your time expires, then you can leave any question along with your name, address, phone number, or email with the county manager. Commissioners are not expected to comment on matters during public comment. Comments should be limited to subjects that are within the jurisdiction of the Commission or pertain to matters upon which we might act. Any individual speaking during public comment shall address the entire board. Any polling of board members is inappropriate. Persons addressing the Commission are expected to observe the decorum of the chamber and to be respectful of everyone in the room, whether we agree with opinions or not. Any person who willfully interrupts, disturbs, or disrupts the session will be asked to leave the meeting. The Commission deserves the right to deny a public address on any subject previously presented to the Board. Is there any public comment tonight? Yes, ma'am, uh, and then you'll be second, sir, on the front row. If you'll give your name and where you live. Betty Jackson, I live in Buncombe County, and I just have a question about the uh, plastic card lock tech deal. Um, <clears throat> are the county taxpayers at all liable? I'd just like to be perfectly clear on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
I will, when we, I think I will, at my discretion, have you explain that. Um, not, let's go ahead and do it right now. Let's just get this, because that's a good question, how this industrial bond works. Uh, this is a, a mechanism that lets certain companies that are going to produce jobs, and industrial jobs, use an internal revenue code um, provision to, uh, to have cheaper debt. So this is a maximum four and a quarter million dollar revenue bond. It's going to be purchased by GE Governmental Finance Incorporated. There is absolutely no obligation to Buncombe County. Plastic Card signs all the documents, all the guarantees on the note. The, this board held a public hearing on the project in December. Um, and so the matter that you have before you tonight is just to approve the closing documents. The Public Facilities Industrial Bond Board, which you appoint, and they, they go over the details of any project that's presented to them and make those recommendations to you. They approve these documents on Tuesday, March 31st. There is absolutely no commitment on Buncombe County's part at all for this debt. Thank you. That answer your question, ma'am. Yes, sir, on the front row. Who wants to speak after this gentleman? Yes, ma'am, in the green shirt, uh, about the fifth row. You'll be next. You can come on up. There's some seats up here. Why don't you come on up? Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman Gant and fellow commissioners. My name is John Haas. I'm the president of the Friends of Town Mountain. Uh, Friends of Town Mountain is a community organization of 350 people, of residents that live all along Town Mountain Road and any road connected to Town Mountain. I'm here tonight to commend the actions of the Buncombe County Sheriff's Department. The weekend of March the 13th, we had six residential burglaries, all occurring during the nighttime. One of those homes was occupied. You can imagine the fright and the fear that, that involved the community during that weekend. We have an excellent communication system, so as every burglary occurred, it was reported, it was communicated to the 350 people that lived on Town Mountain Road. You can imagine what they felt like. Through the efforts of the Buncombe County Sheriff's Department, which were absolutely extraordinary that weekend, they were able to solve these burglaries the following week. It was a partnership between the community and the Sheriff's Department. That's what broke the case. That's what's going to make this community safer. On behalf of the Friends of Town Mountain, we want to personally commend Deputy Pridgen and Deputy Zaval and Detective Moffitt and Detective Buckner. The suspect is currently in the Buncombe County Detention Center under high bond, and we look forward to testifying at his trial. Good job by our Sheriff's Department. Thank you. Thank, we'll tell the Sheriff that. Thank you, Mr. Haas. Yes, ma'am. Who wants to speak after this lady? Uh, lady on the third row in the white shirt. You'll be next. And then after you, the lady in the back, I believe. Y'all come on up the front row there if you want. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Linda Cook, and I currently live in Buncombe County in an R1 zone district. And I'm here today to employ the commissioners to leave R1 and R2 zoning as is and not allow mobile homes in these two zones. According to the County Zoning Office of Buncombe County, 85.59% of the property under Buncombe County's jurisdiction already allows manufactured or mobile homes. That leaves only 14.41% in the R1, R2 districts. Why would this large percent of 85.59% do we need to even rezone R1 and R2 to allow for mobile homes? So this policy would directly threaten the 14.41% of the residents living in these areas and cause their property to decrease in value. According to the Nonprofit International Association of Certified Home Inspectors, manufactured or mobile homes only have to conform to the HUD housing codes, not to state or local codes. Stick built homes or modular homes qualify as real property, which allows them to get traditional loans. At this time, they are very low, and the payoff periods are long. But when you look at manufactured or mobile homes, they are considered personal property like cars and appliances. They don't qualify for conditional, I mean lower traditional loans, but have high interest rates on them. 
they have a short payoff time typically the property that the mobile home is on is rented or leased affordable housing is a complex issue it is not only an issue of high home cost but is an inter it's a issue of low paying jobs nationally that will not allow our citizens to find adequate housing in closing i would like to state if 85.59% of the county under your jurisdiction it already allows mobile homes then why are we trying to fix the problem of affordable housing on the backs of R1 and R2 residents that only make up 14.41% of the county we have we, we if you can finish up Ms. May I just finish that thought we need to got treated so it's my time too. to stop <laughs> yes ma'am okay thank you thank you miss cook uh who let's see um leave you were next and then the lady in the white shirt there i believe i had you next but you go ahead since you're up here who wants to speak at you if you come on up let's go ahead and sit on the front so we can see who's next who wants i think you're next ma'am and who wants to be after this lady yeah just have a seat in front there yeah okay <coughs> don't sit on front row I'm sorry, go ahead. Good to see you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is April Burgess Johnson. I'm the Executive Director for Helpmate. Helpmate is Buncombe County's organization that provides services to victims of domestic violence. And I'm here tonight to speak in support of our application for funding through the Buncombe County Service Foundation. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak during this public comment period as I will be one of the Buncombe County contingent attending the Family Justice Center Alliance Conference in San Diego during the week when you're hearing the other funding presentations. I want to start by saying how much I appreciate and on behalf of the staff and board of Helpmate, we appreciate the leadership that this commission has shown in addressing uh, domestic violence here in Buncombe County and really changing the way that we respond to domestic violence. It's been an inspiring thing to be a part of uh, and I'm grateful for the leadership that you all have shown. Uh, Helpmate has been in Buncombe County for more than 33 years providing critical life-saving life-changing support to victims of domestic violence we have a counseling program an emergency shelter which serves over 200 people every year a court advocacy program case management community education and a 24-hour domestic violence hotline that serves just under 2100 people here in our county every single year um, we are requesting $82,455 worth of support um, from the Buncombe County Service Foundation this year to enable us to sustain and expand our critical case management services for victims of domestic violence. Case management services enable victims in those moments after crisis to access uh, trauma-based counseling services, um, support that they need to rebuild lives free of violence, such as housing-related services, um, support for their children, and navigating the sometimes complex service networks that we have available here in Buncombe County uh, that are designed to meet victims' needs. As the Family Justice Center prepares to open, we, we, we anticipate an even higher increase in the number of service requests that we have. Uh, that is really saying something because last year alone we experienced a 91 percent increase in crisis call volume and a 57 percent increase in overall service requests. The demand was so high that we had to add another rollover line to our crisis hotline to meet the ever-increasing demand that we have for services. Uh, we see this going up with walk-in clients coming through the Family Justice Center as well as um, the implementation of the lethality assessment protocol with local law enforcement in which local law enforcement officers when they respond to the scene of a domestic violence call will be calling helpmates hotline to get an advocate on the line for support with a victim immediately after a domestic violence assault has happened. We also will have an embedded staff member with the Division okay, of cool Department cool. of Social Services and uh, we anticipate that that person will increase our referral base as well. Thank you again for your leadership and for your support. Thank you, April. Yes, ma'am. My name is Ann Bollinger from Weaverville, 
Uh, I was up here at the March meeting speaking for the request to change the zoning of our Weaverville neighborhood from R2 to R1 after the ETJ of Weaverville was taken away by state mandate and after being given the opportunity by this board to apply for a zoning change <laughs> for our neighborhood. I'm really amazed that I'm here again in April uh, at the April meeting speaking to a board about a troubling development. Less than two weeks after this board voted to approve our request to be zoned R1, we read in the paper that there is a discussion going on that would directly impact the R1 and R2 residential zoned areas of Buncombe County. We trusted that the Buncombe County zoning plan and the Buncombe County land use plan really meant something. We spent six long months jumping through every hoop that the application process required while thinking that we would be able to secure some minimal protections for our neighborhood. Wishing to maintain the integrity and look of our long established neighborhood, we gathered applications and worked through every obstacle that this application process required so that we could feel secure in the knowledge that we would be able to offer some protection to the property owners. The vote, as you might remember, was 7-0 for approval. So I kept, can't help thinking that some of you must have really been laughing at us since this issue of allowing manufactured housing in all R1 and R2 residential districts came up so quickly after the vote. The Buncombe County Land Use and Zoning Plans allows for manufactured housing in most of the county, so this, dis this discussion is directly aimed at the R1 and R2 residential zones, which make up a very small percentage of the area outside the townships in Buncombe County. Touted by some as a quick way to fix the affordable housing issue, I would question this line of thinking. Many problems with allowing manufactured homes in all residential districts will lead to unintended consequences in the long run. My own brother and sister-in-law are moving to Buncombe County and are in discussions with a local builder. My sister-in-law told us this weekend at our Easter family dinner that the builder told them they needed to think about building in a gated community if they wanted to preserve the markability of their property because if they were to buy an acre of land somewhere in Buckham County, they would have no control over what type of structures could be placed on adjacent acres. This is what people who are looking to move to, build homes in, and pay taxes in our county are being told, and it's the truth. Thank you, Ms. Bollinger. Who wants to speak next? Uh, Christina? Uh, I'll, let, let's let, uh, why don't you speak and then Ms. Uh, Christine will speak. Okay. All right. Okay. We'll go and then um, you go next and you two next and then Christine after that. Okay. Go on. Well, we'll, we'll take everybody who wants to be heard in public comment. Okay. This is not before us tonight, but we, yeah. we, will, we will hear no. you. I'm Ann Callison Stokely and I live in the Reams Creek area <coughs> of Weaverville as well. And I, along with Ann Bollinger and a number of other people in the audience, we were part of the, the down zoning application just at the, the um, March meeting. And when I first read in the March 18th issue of the Asheville Citizen Times that the commissioners were considering the possibility of allowing manufactured homes throughout Buncombe County <clears throat> across all zoning districts, I did a bit of homework. And while doing my homework, I came to understand that there's an important distinction between manufactured homes and modular homes. And actually, the Citizen Times article was a little misleading the way it read because it, it referred to them as factory-built homes. In fact, there are important differences between manufactured homes and modular homes. Uh, manufactured homes, uh, or single wides and double wides, uh, are factory-built. They're both factory-built. The manufactured homes are built on a steel chassis and transported to a building site. The wheels can be removed, but the chassis remains. Modular homes do not have axles or a frame. The modular components are transported to a building site and assembled by a crane. Placement of the modules may take several days to assemble, and once assembled, modular homes are essentially indistinguishable from uh, typical stick-built homes. As a woman earlier said, manufactured homes do not have to comply uh, with the much stricter state and building codes, as do modular and stick-built homes. Instead, they are built only to HUD regulations. They are difficult to re remodel or repair, and subsequently they depreciate much more quickly. 
and banks and lending institutions recognize this distinction um, at, at, because manufactured homes are not eligible for conventional mortgages and are usually financed with loans that carry very high interest rates and many of the man financiers of manufactured homes have been criticized for predatory lending practices. Manufactured homes are legally considered personal property and I think this is fair because they depreciate like an automobile. Adding restrictions such as bricks, uh, brick underskirting and gutters frequently can serve to make these homes unaffordable for those who need them most and can result in loan foreclosures after buyers have been lured into investing them. I do not believe this would be in the best interest of Buncombe County primarily <laughs> because it would uh, erode property values countywide and that doesn't help anyone. It would change the character of existing R1 and R2 neighborhoods. Um, <laughs> And that has to be the goal of this measure since it's allowed already everywhere outside R1 and R2 neighborhoods. Um, developers who can afford the price of land in those neighborhoods would be able to buy lots and bring in manufactured homes as rental property. In other words, de facto mobile home parks would spring up in established neighborhoods as profitable investments for absentee landlords who do not have to consider the consequences for their neighborhood. And I challenge anyone listening to ask themselves, how would you feel about having manufactured homes rolled onto an available lots in your neighborhood to be rented out to residents who have no long-term commitment to the community? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coakley. Uh, yes, ma'am. My name is Linda Kraft, and I'm in the same neighborhood with this group of people. As a homeowner in an R1 zone district, my husband and I are very concerned that allowing manufactured homes in areas with R1 single family homes would have many unintended consequences and that issues would arise that would not have even been considered. Affordable housing is an undeniable issue in our county, but is allowing manufactured homes in all residential districts the answer to this situation? There are few lots for sale in our area right now and the lots are not inexpensive. The cost then of buying a manufactured home, pulling it to the lot, setting it up to standards that would make it compatible to the neighborhood, and then maintaining it does not seem to me to be a simple answer to a difficult problem. Manufactured homes are loaned as personal property, like a car, so that loan costs are typically higher than loans for modular and stick-built homes. They are not as easy as modular and stick-built homes to remodel. I would also like to remind you that as of January 1, 2014, the sales tax limit on mobile homes was repealed by the state of North Carolina. Before the tax overhaul, the state capped mobile home sales taxes at $300 for single-wide and $600 for a double-wide. Under the new tax law, manufactured homes are required to pay a 4.75% sales tax rate. I would urge the Board of Commissioners to look at other avenues of addressing the affordable housing issue. Remember that R1 and R2 zoning areas only make up a small percentage of the residential areas of this county. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Craft. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Sarah Faulkner, and I live in Weaverville. Um, I'm here to urge you to not lift the ban on mobile homes in R1 and R2 zoning districts. I say mobile homes specifically because currently modular homes are allowed in R1 and R2 districts. Both mobile and modular homes are defined as manufactured homes. Again, modular homes are currently allowed in R1 and R2 districts. Mobile homes defined as single, double, and triple wides are built on a steel chassis and transported to a home site, whereas modular homes do not have axles or frame and are anchored to the ground. Modular components are transported to a home site and assembled with a crane. Both types of homes are factory built. The important difference between the two is that mobile homes are considered personal property and modular homes are considered real property, as is a stick-built home. The difference is significant when it comes to loan financing. According to a report conducted by the Habitat for Humanity, the long-term financial implications of these different loans uncovers a startling reality. Mobile homes can cost significantly more than conventional or modular homes over a long term. For example, a conventional home loan for $90,000 at 4% APR over 30 years is $430 per month or $154,000, while a personal property loan of $90,000 at 12.5% APR over 30 years is $960 per month or $345,000. In addition, the overall market values differ in that modular, excuse me, in that mobile homes generally depreciate in value as stick-built and modular homes appreciate over long term. 
Strong home equity is an important factor in providing stability for low-income families to achieve upward mobility. Unfortunately, families that choose to purchase a mobile home are unknowingly preventing themselves from achieving this goal. These families are subject to predatory sales practices, exorbitant fees, and interest rates that can exceed 15 percent, trapping buyers in loans they cannot afford and in homes that are impossible to sell or refinance. The manufactured housing industry is pushing to deregulate the already hazardous financing, cli finan financing climate for these families. On March 26, 2015, the Financial Services Committee passed the Preserving Access to Manufactured Housing Act, which would increase interest rates and eliminate mandatory borrower counseling programs. This deregulation will increase the profits of those in the manufactured housing industry at the sacrifice of consumers' financial security. Our responsibility as a community should be to provide smart, affordable housing solutions and not open the door to potentially harmful options for families in need. In conclusion, the issue before us is lifting the ban on mobile homes, defined as single, double, and triple wides in R1 and R2 zoning districts. Again, modular homes and economical manufactured option are currently allowed in R1 and R2 neighborhoods. Thank you for your careful consideration of this issue. And if I may, I would like to ask all those who are in favor of not lifting this ban to please stand up. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Um, Christine. Thank you. Next. And then, gentlemen, you'll be after her. Good evening. I'm Christina Merrill, and I live in Fairview. And um, I'd like to address the exorbitant cost of the proposed Buncombe County shooting range. Uh, as you may know, our neighbors in Cleveland County broke ground on a new shooting complex yesterday. The Cleveland County Commissioners partnered with several agencies to help make it happen at a fraction of the cost <coughs> Buncombe is looking at. When built, it will draw people from surrounding states for training and competition. The economical price tag for the shooting facility in Shelby is just $1.7 million and open to the public with the nominal user fee, which will generate revenue and a return on investment. The range will also serve local law enforcement training, and there will eventually be a driving course for first responder equipment testing and training. Here in Buncombe County, we have several sites that would lend themselves to a similar facility. Unfortunately, the majority of our commissioners would rather spend $7 million on an exclusive facility that only law enforcement personnel have access to and exclude the taxpayers who are footing the bill. As usual, this seems to be a poor use of taxpayer funds for an overpriced project that only benefits a small segment of the populace. It's past time to start thinking outside of the box and change business as usual here in Buncombe, where our county commissioners repeatedly dip into the pockets of our citizens for bloated and overinflated projects without considering or taking the time to find outside resource opportunities. These outside resource opportunities in the past um, have been trivialized and wrongfully labeled as bake sale money by some of your colleagues who share a spend more tax more mentality. Here are some specifics I urge you to look at on behalf of our overburdened citizens. There are matching funds available from the National Rifle Association and the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission for range development. In Shelby, the Cleveland County Commissioners figured out how to build the most state-of-the-art and largest shooting range in North Carolina for just $1.7 million. The range will benefit law enforcement as well as the public. But here, Buncombe County Commissioners are looking at spending nearly $7 million on a facility that would not bring any revenue and excludes public use. This makes no sense. I leave you with this question. Why does the cost of living continue to skyrocket here in our county? This is a perfect example. We need to take this opportunity to shine a light on this continued reckless and irresponsible spending of our tax dollars and show a positive example of our neighboring county's fiscally responsible planning and leadership. I thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the people that are paying your salary and high taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Merrill. Yes, sir. And then uh, Lady in the red and then uh, with your hand up come on up front too <laughs> can't see your face but uh, you'll be next and you ma'am you'll be after the lady in red yes sir good afternoon ladies and gentlemen my name is fred flaxman and i live at uh, 36 pickens lane in buncombe county 
just outside the Weaverville town limits. I come to you be in opposition to the idea that I understand you are considering to allow single, double, and triple wide manufactured homes throughout Buncombe County, regardless of the zoning classification of the area. I think this is a terrible idea for the following reasons. One, these homes are already permitted in 80% of the county where there is plenty of room for more of them. Two, they are usually financed with loans which carry very high interest rates, which are no help to those who are most in need of affordable housing. Three, they depreciate in value, just like cars and trucks, as soon as they leave the lot. Also, uh, that acts against the long-term interests of low-income people. The lifespan of a manufactured home is far shorter than that of a stick-built or modular home. Su then five, such homes are not as safe in violent storms and hurricanes as conventionally built houses. Six, it is difficult to address age-related structural issues in manufactured homes. Seven, they are not subject to Buncombe County building codes, only to less strict HUD standards, as ha has been pointed out. Eight, they would depreciate the value of the homes already built in R1 and R2 residential zoning districts, and thus the taxes to the county paid by those current homeowners. This is bad for the homeowners and bad for the county. Nine, since land in R1 and R2 areas is generally more expensive than in the rest of the county, it is financially impractical to purchase small lots in those zones for single-family mobile homes. The result would be large parcels purchased and turned into trailer parks, most likely with absentee owners, which would depreciate the value of and tax revenue from surrounding properties. Ten, finally, I'm concerned that approval of such a zoning change would reflect poorly on the Board of Commissioners itself due to the appearance of a possible conflict of interest since the idea was proposed by and is being advocated by a commissioner who was an executive in the manufactured housing industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not against affordable housing for Buncombe County. On the contrary, but I'm against unsafe, unsightly, inferior housing for low-income people. I'm in favor of making good housing affordable by raising the income of low-income, hard-working people by laws guaranteeing them a minimum wage, which is a fair wage and a living wage. Many thanks for hearing me out. Mr. Flaxman. Yes, ma'am, in the red. Hi, my name is Alicia Davis. Um, I am not here to talk about affordable housing or decreasing property values. Um, I am here to talk about case management. Uh, I became a client of Homeward Bound in 2005 when I came to Asheville and became homeless. Um, I had addiction issues and mental health issues that uh, I felt like I couldn't defeat. Um, I was introduced to A Hope Day Center and uh, received case management support from a few people there for about three years. Um, I was housed a couple of times. It, it took about three tries before it actually stuck. Um, the case management support that I received when I was a client there um, was just incredible and uh, really moving and in inspiring. Um, I graduated from the uh, Homeward Bound program in 2008 and uh, became a staff member of Homeward Bound in 2011. I am now a case manager with uh, Project Rebound. Um, we provide case management for some of the most vulnerable, um, high need clientele in Asheville. Um, we have a very high retention rate, housing retention rate. Uh, because the case management that we provide, we offer um, resources for substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment, um, domestic violent treatment, anything that you can think of really. Um, I was hired on as a peer support specialist because I have lived experience with those issues. And I believe that without the case management that I received when I was homeless, I don't think I would be standing here at a commissioner board meeting right now. 
Um, I feel it's very important to the housing retention rate that once our clients are housed, that that's really when life begins for them and things happen. And it's up to case managers and those folks having support from case managers to actually be normal citizens of Buncombe County. Um, my supervisor, who was one of my case managers back in 2005, couldn't be here today. Uh, she is actually with someone who just got diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. Um, so she is receiving support from one of her case managers, you know, in a really extremely difficult issue to handle. Um, yesterday, another example, we had a client who came to our office who said that he was just lonely. You know, he's facing mortality issues with his father who has Alzheimer's disease and needed to get reconnected with mental health services. So we called and made an appointment and he is going to receive those services um, next Monday. So thank you very much. Thank you for sharing Ms. Davis. Yes, ma'am, green shirt. And then a uh, gentleman uh, in the third, fourth row there will be next. And then a uh, lady in the back there, you'll be third up. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Gil Kronowski and I live near the Woodfin Fire and Training Emergency uh, Training Center. And I would like to, to express concern over the proposed indoor firing range to be placed at the training facility. We are all very grateful for the work that our police and fire do, and we all want them to have the very best training available. But we are also concerned about putting such a facility adjoining residential areas. The indoor firing range is a substantial capital investment for the county, but it also has, has substantial consequences for the area residents. And if the board insists on going forward with that, we would like to have the opportunity to, to view the plans, to discuss contingency plans if the soundproofing is not what is expected, and to generally hear the residents' concerns such as um, <coughs> uh, just general noise, um, hours of operation, uh, increased traffic, landscaping op options to, in to enhance. Um, but this is a very serious issue and has, does have the possibility, uh, the potential for grave consequences for our area. Um, and it will greatly impact our quality of life as well as our property values going forward, which also affects county values as well. Thank you very much. Ms. Pranowski, we'll make sure the county manager and sheriff accommodate you on that. That's very important to us also. Thank you, Thank you for bringing it up. Yes, sir. And then uh, I think someone in the Two back. In the Two in front. Okay, you're already here. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Hi, my name is Derek Toll. I work for Hamlet Brown's A Hope Day Center. Um, I am here to advocate for the for A Hope to uh, receive funding through the Buncombe County Service Foundation for a coordinated assessment. Um, I started as a volunteer at the A Hope Day Center and I volunteered as much as I could because what I saw there was relationship building with the most vulnerable individuals in the community, something that I hadn't seen any place else. A, a lot of these people, a lot of our clients, when they come to us, they don't feel like they have a place in society. Through the relationship building that A Hope has done over the years, we have helped people find their way back into the fold. Uh, a case managers have um, a connection to all social service agencies that could potentially be of use to the clients in their path toward recovery. We're the hub of homeless services in the community, and that's what makes us a great place for, for coordinated assessment to happen. Essentially, coordinated assessment will just allow us to streamline what we already do. We'll become more efficient with the way that we use money so that we serve the clients that need it most. We will be targeting the appropriate service to the appropriate client through a statistically proven system. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Derek. Yes, ma'am. 
My name is Asia Heller, and I also work for Homeward Bound at the A Hope Day Center. Um, and I'm here to speak to the same issue for coordinated assessment funding. Um, when I started at A Hope uh, five and a half years ago, uh, it felt great because we um, provided a lot of basic services. It felt great to engage with folks by handing them towels to take showers um, and uh, conversing over coffee and really getting to build that relationship. Um, but essentially, we were engaged <coughs> in uh, relief work with folks. Um, and and being a, um, a balm on the wound um, there. And um, we were a shelter from the storm, and we gave people coffee and hugs because they need it, but also because that we didn't have more to offer necessarily. Um, and then um, not long after I started Homeward Bound, started focusing our efforts on housing folks and really finding a solution to homelessness um, and, um, and getting people off the streets and into housing. Um, <clears throat> we did the best we could to continue providing basic services and shifting our conversations and efforts towards housing. Over the last year, AHOPE has made tremendous efforts to implement the system of coordinated assessment. Instead of simply relying on the relationships we have built over thousands of cups of coffee to house people, we are using an evidence-based tool to assess people's needs so that the appropriate funds are being used where they will have the greatest effect. Homer Bound has housed over a thousand people, most of whom, who, most of whom came through AHOPE for coffee and basic services uh, and were connected to housing. Um, I look forward to continue coming to work um, because I can't imagine what AHOPE will be able to do once we are funded uh, to implement coordinated, coordinated assessment and to actually fund us to house people. So, Thank you, Ms. Heller. <coughs> Let's see. I think you were, ma'am, I think I had you next. Go ahead purple shirt and then are you with her sir okay I have you next if you want to speak after her yes ma'am I'm Connie Callback from 100 Dogwood Drive in Weaverville um, the residents of the greater Dogwood area where I live worked very hard last fall to get the zoning change from R2 to R1 we turned in um, 150 personally signed applications to have the zoning change and the homeowner spoke here last month just last month about this issue and the board voted unanimously and we basked in our glory we basked in our success but not for long less than two weeks later came this article in the paper in the Astro Citizen Times about the county may allow factory built homes. We discovered the zoning could possibly make no difference at all as to what kind of houses can be provided in any neighborhood in most zones in the county. I can't tell you how great my disappointment is that the board would consider the possibility of manufactured homes as the answer to affordable housing. And people have already talked about what kind of housing that is, but one of the telling things in the article here is that the homes could have gutters and brick skirting to make them look like houses. Some facts to think about are these. The manufactured homes deteriorate quickly. They don't appreciate the way most homes do. And they require a personal loan at a higher rate of interest like cars than for stick build homes and that isn't exactly what you call affordable also bringing in homes like these completely manufactured off-site wouldn't create local jobs this opens the door also to developers from outside and we've already had this happen but the point is they care nothing about this area or the people who live in it they can come in and buy up whatever available land they can find and for a low investment throw up inexpensive housing with no longevity in the structures and charge rental rates that again aren't necessarily affordable we'll be keeping close eye on this issue thank you for listening thank you Ms. Colvin yes sir and who will speak after this gentleman uh, we'll have you two next after him My name is Gary Callback from Weaverville, North Carolina. Uh, before I met her uh, um, almost 30 years ago, I lived in a mobile home when I was young. And I bought it. And uh, 
it gradually decreased in value very quickly, and I wound up taking a, a bath on it. And uh, I would have been better off in an apartment with the school board had recommended at the time when I was teaching school in Kentucky. Um, what I want to bring up to attention here is that it's a lot of politics are going on here. And this, uh, Sarah passed an article to me that I read. This is from the Seattle Times, April 2nd. And the headline is, The Mobile Home Trap, How a Warren Buffett Empire Preys on the Poor. Again, this is from Seattle Times just a week ago. It's extended article. It's the first in a series of many articles. And I have the front page, and I have the URL for you. I'll pass it out to you, and you can all have it. Um, but the main thing is that people don't need a handout. They need a hand up. And uh, just like we hear here, it was interesting to hear this about uh, helping the, helping the, uh, the homeless the, the homeless need to be have ownership so they can eventually participate with everybody else and that's the end goal and people who get into the bottom of the barrel and are brought up by these wonderful people I, I, uh, I congratulate but a mobile home is not an answer I can tell that tell you that from experience so may I pass give this to the board yes, sir. after you are you through where are you I'm through, through now yes okay yes sir Ms. thank Coleman. you certainly thank you yes ma'am on the front row Hello, my name is Madeline Wadley and I'm here to speak about funding for Homeward Bound of Western North Carolina and the A Hope Day Center program. Um, I've been a staff member at A Hope Day Center for nearly two years and prior to that I was a volunteer through Warren Wilson College. I've been involved with Homeward Bound for the past six years because I believe all human beings have inherent worth and deserve to live with dignity and respect. Homeward Bound strives daily to restore dignity for community members who have lost everything. Sometimes that only involves a shower and a cup of coffee, but many times it is guiding people on the path to permanent housing. Housing First is both cost effective and beneficial. One person who is homeless can cost taxpayers $23,000 through use of shelters and emergency services. A person who has been housed only costs approximately $10,000. Once a person is housed, they have a solid foundation for rebuilding their life with the help of Homeward Bound case management and community support. Through coordinated assessment, our community has the opportunity to streamline how we offer housing assistance, finding homes for, for people who need them as quickly and efficiently as possible while prioritizing those who are most vulnerable with increased numbers of volunteers. I'm sorry, <laughs> by, um, by streamlining housing as quickly and efficiently as possible while prioritizing, prioritizing those who are the most vulnerable. With increased numbers of volunteers, A Hope Day Center staff will be able to spend more time case managing clients, helping to meet their needs, reach their goals, and prepare for a su successful transition into housing. For years, A Hope has been the gateway to services for people experiencing homelessness in Asheville. As the main coordinated assessment site, we can continue our work of restoring dignity and housing the homeless both efficiently and compassionately. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wadley. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Leslie Stewart. I also work with Homeward Bound, um, and I'm also here to advocate for the funding for Project Rebound and A Hope and coordinated assessment. Um, back in October of 2014, re we received a significant grant to work towards ending veteran homelessness by the end of this year. So we're going to work over this next year and the following two years to work towards ending veteran homelessness. Um, we received this through the Department of Veterans Affairs, and it is a vet it's a VA mandated. Um, part of this grant that we participate in coordinated assessment. There are two crucial parts of this, and that is outreach through AHOPE and also this coordinated assessment process, which we are actively participating in. It's a really smart way for us to think about how we are intervening when veterans are homeless so that we can make sure that the right intervention is happening and that folks will be able to sustain once they are in housing through case management with Homeward Bound. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sorrell. Uh, let's see. Your front row has been reached. Everybody? Yes, sir, Mr. Yelton, and then we'll have the uh, lady on the second row. Don Yelton, Jupiter, North Carolina. And I come before you to talk about 
a topic near and dear to my heart. And only one commissioner up there has heard me say this many times. CTS is not going to go away. I'd like for you to listen to the dates. Because on September the 16th, 2014, this board took action to seek for reimbursement of public funds spent on putting water lines out there where there was necessary. CTS and Mills Gap Road Associates made a confidential federal litigation agreement in 2014. As of January 2014, the chair of the county commissioners was aware of the fact that Bob Deutsch, a county attorney, was a 15-year-plus law partner of John Powell, one of the Mills Gap Road Associate Partners. Actually, the law offices and Mills Gap Road Associates shared the same address as the law offices. When I contacted Human Resources today about the beginning of Bob Deutsch's employment, I was told he was not listed there. I then called the Finance Department and I was told by the lady that answered the phone to call Human Services. At that point, I explained to her that I had just done that, and that was why I was calling her. And I assume this may be the finance <laughs> director sitting over here. If it is, I want to thank him because I got a rapid reply today. If I didn't and he's not here, you please express appreciation to him. Because he called me back and told me that the first check cut for attorney Bob Deutsch was November the 29th, 2013 of the amount of $4,000. I also remind you that the Bar Association does not take lightly the lying or a nice way of saying misrepresenting information to a client. Chairman Gant, you represent the citizens of Buncombe County, especially those in South Asheville, and you are attorney. Robert L. Dortch is hired by you as commissioners to represent us. And I hope that has happened in the last three years since November the 29th, 2013. And there's nothing there that will be later exposed. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Yes, ma'am, on the second row. Hi, my name is Francina Griffith, and I'm here to speak on A Hope and Homeward Bound. I went to, uh, to another place in September to a homeless shelter, but then I found out about three weeks later about A Hope. So I went to A Hope. The people there showed me the way. Um, I guess a better way of living and everything. And then they, um, the coordinators there and case managers there has helped me a lot since I've been there. And I've um, been there ever since like, uh, a little in, in the end of no November. I got in the, the program there through Homeward Bound and, that, and they had helped me, I, they found I helped myself too. They got me a job, and now we're working on a place to live, which will probably be a couple months on down the line. But I want to invite y'all to come down there sometime, eat donuts and coffee, and see how it goes. <laughs> and y'all enjoy it too. All right. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Thank you. Who wants to speak after Ms. Griffin? Yes, sir. And Mr. Rice, uh, this gentleman, and then uh, Mr. Rice. Who wants to speak after Mr. Rice? Okay, you'll be you'll be third and you'll be fourth. I'm Dayton Maley. I like to speak on on the R2 and R1 about the mobile homes and stuff. I live in Weaverville. That that everybody needs a place to live, but I don't think the uh, that they are to take and put the uh, burden on the back of people to spend their life savings and stuff in a 
in their homes and stuff for the value to come down. We have a house in our neighborhood now that was just sold. 35 clients came through that, through that house and none of them wanted, 19 of them wanted the house, but nobody wanted to live in a neighborhood where there was a place that was being rented that wasn't being taken care of and that will bring down the property tax and the price of homes in our area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neely. Yes, Mr. Rice and then uh, lady on the front row. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member of the board. I'm a native here. I've been here for 64 years, whether people wanted me here or not. But I have a twin brother, so, you know, I'll add up that. I've lived here all my life in Weaverville, where I was growed up mostly uh, as a first grader anyway. I, I take issue here today with the comments that's being said. I appreciate you county commissioners taking it on you to bring mobile homes anywhere that you can get them put. Anywhere. Bar none. Because I'm going to tell you why. Being here all my life, living in cabins, living in houses you could throw the cat through, get rained on or snowed on, and there's 19 of us, so we didn't have the best of everything, but there's one thing we had. We had love for one another, and we had love for our community, and we know how to be compassionate and, and know how to treat people. That's one thing that we knew how to do, and we know how to do it today. And I certainly take issue with people that wants to come in here to live in gated communities if they want to live in gated communities, they need to go back to New York, they need to go back to Michigan or anywhere they're from and live there and quit coming here and putting burdens on us as taxpayers and as natives. A native people here is becoming people that's going to be on a reservation before long. I'm a natural native of the Cherokee Indians in my family, and I know what that means. But when it comes down to the issue of living what do you think about Abraham Lincoln and the people that lived in cabins? Would that be affordable? Would that be looked upon or down upon today? Or would it be affordable? I think there need to be pride in what you do, but there need to be love in it to the point that you come here with solutions on how to fix a problem. The problem is not being fixed by complaints about these mobile homes next door. When you've got the highest percentage of people on education, kids without in, uh, diplomas in Buncombe County and the multi-millions and billions of dollars that we've spent over these years, and then we are trying to fix a problem, if we can't educate them, we sure can't get them better jobs. If we can't get better jobs, we need to move them closer in to where they're getting these $3 jobs or $7 jobs. They move them closer in to where they can afford to live here. And these mobile homes is a great place to live. They certainly ain't a log cabin. They certainly ain't out in the weather. At least they've got something over their head that's worthwhile. So I take issue with anybody. I'd like to sit down with any of these folks and find out where they come from and how much money they brought here to buy what they got. Because most of them that's coming here today can afford anything. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Sharon Blythe, and I'm an employee of Homeward Bound of Western North Carolina. I am privileged <laughs> to spend my days walking with people like Francina that spoke to you. Um, in support of the um, AHOPE Coordinated Assessment Grant application, I think I would like for um, you to know a little bit more about Francina than she shared, which is that when she came to us, she didn't have a case manager, and therefore she didn't know what direction she needed to take to, to get from where she was, which is homeless, to where she wants to be, which is housed and sustainable. And so through the process of working with me and my colleagues, a lot of which have spoken here today, um, Francina found a job. She came to me one day and said, I want to work. And I said, so find a job. And three days later, she went to work full time. And that's where I picked her up today. So I know when we stand up here and we say coordinated assessment, some of you know what that is and some of you maybe don't know what that is, but it's a process to streamline homeless folks into housing based on vulnerability. 
So it helps us as a community take the most vulnerable off the streets as quickly as we can and put them back in housing. Um, when a client comes to the Hope Day Center, they are connected to that staff, and that's how that relationship starts on the, on the A Hope floor. What's the beauty of coordinated assessment is that they are going to be assigned to a staff member, which is a privilege that I've had with my program for five years, so we know it works. Um, I case manage full time. So by having that case manager to walk through the process with them to determine the housing avenue for them, they become more stable just in the process. If we could take everybody today and put them in housing tomorrow and work ourselves out of a job, let me assure you all that we would, <laughs> but that's not our reality. The trauma that comes from living in the homeless community is not easy to overcome, and having an individual person that you can call your case manager to walk with you to do that is huge for the folks that we serve. So our community, I feel like, has come so far in ending homelessness and I think we're going to get there. I don't think there's any doubt about it. I hope that this board and this commission sees the importance of coordinated assessment like we do and the case management relationship like we do um, and that you'll continue to support Homeward Bound as we do that going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Daniel. Privilege to follow Sharon. Um, I've been working at AHOOP um, for three and a half years um, and here to speak um, in, uh, in regards to the uh, coordinated ass assessment application for service foundation funding um, uh, and add to this uh, what's been said. Um, I think one thing to say about AHOOP is we, we have uh, we have the pulse on the difficult realities of, uh, that surround homelessness in our community. We see its face every day. We hear its story. Um, we also have uh, a great sense of uh, the complexities of housing because um, uh, we, we walk with folks, we face the frustrations, and we really know what, what it's up against. And we also know our limitations in time and space uh, to address those things. And this, uh, um, um, supporting this, uh, this room, this space to, to be more intentional would, would allow us to, um, to change with those needs to, to work with folks in a much more intentional, efficient uh, way to find something that's sustainable and smart. One thing about AHOPE is that we've, we've, we're good at adapting. We started out in a basement back in the, in the late 80s, and we've shifted, and we've always been interested in partnering with people and uh, bringing people into the, to, the, to, uh, to the discussion and applying for new grants, and we've been, we've, we've been risk takers. And as you can see with our support, we really believe this is where, this is the next step to be smarter and wiser and um, about what we do and to, because uh, housing is, is growingly complex. Since I've worked there, I've seen it more difficult. Uh, it's a little slower. In some in some aspects, and it takes a lot more creativity, a lot more advocacy, and this would allow us to to know what to bring to the table, to know how to how to meet people in their need, and to be advocates in the community. Um, so, thank you for your time to listen to all of us. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, sir. Who won't speak after this gentleman? He'll be next after this man. My name is Julian Palin. I'm from the Weaverville area, and I've heard quite a bit of discussion, pro and con, but specifically what bothers me is with our highway system, Route 40, Route 26, most of us fly through our beautiful country, and it is beautiful down here. But take those side roads from, let's say, well, Weaverville up to Bars Hill. And you go off along some of these side roads, they're not developed with cement or asphalt, and you'll find some of the trailers in there that's been here for a few years to a point where they're abandoned. 
someone says that most of the building material in a trailer is primarily it is wood with the basis, basics of being steel. So the amount of steel in a trailer probably wouldn't exceed $200 at a scrapyard. Now, in order to take that trailer down to being able to sell that stuff, you have labor involved in tearing it apart. That labor will cost you quite a bit of money. So ultimately, my point is, what happens to these units? These units are left there to rot because basically someone who's dissatisfied with what they see don't have the money to, or the, the necessary education to tear these things apart in order to break it down into the material that could be sold. So what happens, these trailers are there. And if you doubt my word, take a trip off of Route 40, Route 26, into some of these side roads. And you'll see some of these trailers that have been abandoned. And ultimately, when you abandon a trailer, it's no use to anyone because number one, it pays no more taxes. So we're in a situation where the idea of putting in trailers to minimize the cost of having those people who can't afford to pay the sufficient funds to own a place. I think in a long run, we're in a situation where if this goes through and trailers are allowed, specifically I'm talking about the mobile trailers because there is no comparison between a modular unit and a mobile unit because we're talking about two different things and thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Let's see. Yes, sir, you're next. And who will speak after this gentleman? Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, my name is Jay Mackey. I live in Candler and I'm here to discuss uh, homeward Bounds application for coordinated assessment funding uh, through the Buncombe County Service Foundation. Um, I am a employee of Homeward Bound. I've been working at the A Hope Day Center for uh, close to two years and I've seen a lot of progress through individuals of our community there. Um, what coordinate, coordinated assessment itself allows us to do with clients is to prioritize um, their vulnerability to match them with the appropriate housing interventions um, so that we're spending money wisely and efficiently so that um, those individuals who only need a little bit of help we give them that little bit of help and a lot of encouragement and motivation to do the next things they need to do to take themselves to that place those individuals who need a lot more assistance were there to provide that. And um, it's also in uh, AHOPE is a convenient entry point um, for all of our individuals and families experiencing homelessness. They can stop in, meet with a staff member there. We can perform this assessment and start planning with them. Um, and that planning isn't just about how they're going to find housing. That planning is also how are they getting their basic needs met? What are they doing right now um, to where are they going to stay tonight? How are they going to get food today? Um, are these people looking for work? How can we help them find work through a lot of the community resources? Um, entitlement benefits, helping them um, get access to mental health, behavioral health, substance abuse um, and addictions treatment. Um, it's, it's a very wide range that coordinated assessment um, covers all of this. When we're sitting with this individual, we're looking at their whole picture, not just about getting them into a house, but there's a lot of other things that make them succeed in having in landing that house and then in staying in that house and having all of the necessary support around them 
so that they can live a fulfilling life and start contributing back to the community again. Um, so coordinated assessment is very valuable to us, to our individuals and families experiencing homelessness, and to the community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mackey. Any other public comment tonight? All righty, seeing none, and we will be taking up some matters in public hearing, which will be another um, point. Um, thank you. If anyone wants to leave, uh, we, we, we're, everyone's welcome to stay, but if you want to leave, we'll just pause a second and give you a chance to uh, get up. Thank you for coming tonight. While they are going, I would like to uh, take a personal privilege and honor one of our members. Mr. Mike Fryer got an honorary degree from AB Tech um, this week, and we are proud of him. Let me, uh, let me read some of the highlights uh, in his honorary degree. Whereas Mr. Fryer uh, resided in Buncombe County for over 50 years, attending A.C. Reynolds High School, Whereas Mr. Fryer served his country honorably in the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam conflict. Whereas Mr. Fryer is a self-made man, owning a successful business, Fryer performance since 1980. Whereas Mr. Fryer served with distinction, has served and is serving, a distinction on the Board of Commissioners representing District 2 since January 2013. Whereas Mr. Fryer has ab advocated tirelessly for efficient and cost-effective government. Whereas Mr. Fryer has likewise served with distinction on the Board of Trustees of AB Technical College since 2013, representing the college with equal diligence and tenacity. And whereas Mr. Fryer has applied the same interest in saving taxpayer dollars to recent construction projects on the college campus, while also providing state-of-the-art educational facilities needed for a world-class college. Be it resolved by the Board of Trustees for AB Tech Community Colleges that Mr. Fryer is conferred an honorary associate degree in government management on May 16, 2015 at the commencement in a resolution adopted April 6, 2015. Commissioner Fryer, we're proud of you. And we look forward to your commencement on May 16. Next up we have, is there a motion to follow the consent agenda with the following amendments? Uh, we will be pulling up the approval of the March 17, 2015 emergency meeting, and we will also get the budget line item from the capital projects uh, ordinance, and we will also, um, do we want to talk, is plastic card, if we, if we talked about that, we want to bring that one up? All right, in? Done. All right already done that one, okay. So is there an approval? of the minute of the uh, proposed agenda with those corrections. Uh, okay. Been a motion by Commissioner Jones, second by Vice Chair Belcher. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 I'll oppose no. Then we will follow the amendment of uh, the uh, <coughs> budget as we have uh, a budget as the uh, agenda. And that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> the agenda as we have uh, proclaimed. And while we're on proclamations, we have Child Abuse uh, Prevention Month, Vice Chair Belcher, and we'll ask Ms. Henson, Nilsen, Swanson to come up if they're here to accept the proclamation. And maybe Ms. Pittman, is she is Ms. Pittman here? No? You know? Oh, you're already there. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Belcher, if you'll read the proclamation. County of Buncombe Proclamation for Child Abuse Abuse Prevention Month. Whereas the problem of child abuse and neglect affects many of the Buncombe County's children and has reached epidemic proportions in North Carolina over, with over 129,000 reports investigated for abuse and neglect last year. And whereas last year the Buncombe County Health and Human Services Department received 4,687 reports of child abuse and neglect. And whereas preventing child abuse and neglect is the responsibility of all citizens and every child has the right to a safe, healthy, nurturing environment. And whereas research shows that complex problems such as child abuse and neglect require coordinated efforts, 
across a multiple of disciplines, including mental health, domestic violence, substance abuse, child advocacy, school nursing, and public health. And whereas Buncombe County is committed to coordinating and aligning our resources with community partners, so we are focused on evidence-informed best practices with demonstrated improved outcomes. And whereas Buncombe County has joined forces with the Child Protection Team of Buncombe County, Child Abuse Prevention Services, Inc., and Mission Children's Health to reach out to parents, caregivers, and children to prevent child abuse and neglect. And whereas it is recognized that Buncombe County's Domestic Violence Campaign, Family Justice Center, One Stop Mental Health Services for Children and Adults, and the development and support of an accredited child advocacy center will support these prevention efforts. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of Commissioners for the County of Buncombe as follows, that the month of April 2015 be proclaimed Child Abuse Prevention Month in Buncombe County, that this board does hereby call upon every citizen to join the child protection organizations, groups, and individuals in observance of the month with appropriate programs and activities to report child abuse and neglect. When in doubt, report by calling 828-250-5900 that this proclamation be effective upon its adoption. Adopted this the seventh day of April 2014, Board of Commissioners by the County of Buncombe, signed by David Gant, Chairman. Okay, is there a motion to accept the resolution? I'll moved. take that as a motion. Uh, is there, uh, I'll just call the question. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, ladies, tell us about how we're doing. We just had a wonderful pinwheel uh, presentation before the meeting about a, a great innovative program you're working on. Tell us about that and how you're doing. Well, thank you. I'm Leslie Hansen and I'm the Interim Director at Child Abuse Prevention Services and our focus is on prevention education. Last year we reached over 10,000 students in our area and we also provide crisis counseling in our area. And we want to thank uh, the county for all of the work that they do along with us and for the other agencies and nonprofits in our area who work so hard on domestic violence and on child abuse prevention. Hello, I'm Jennifer Nielsen. I serve as the district administrator for the Guardian Ad Litem program for Buncombe County. I also have the privilege of serving as the current chair of the Community Child Protection Team and the Children's Collaborative of Buncombe County. I'm also a proud mother and foster mother. Um, I can tell you that Buncombe County is unusual in the coordination and collaboration that occurs between child serving agencies. Um, in many um, counties across the state, my counterparts talk of fights, disagreements, um, bureaucratic barriers being placed um, that ultimately impact the well-being and safety of children. And in Buncombe County, we work to eliminate those barriers. Um, so I'm very, very pleased to stand before you today and report on all of the efforts, the coordination, the collaboration that is occurring to protect the most vulnerable members of our, our community. And I thank you for all of your efforts and support on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Katie Swanson and I'm honored to actually work for Health and Human Services and stand before you today to let you know that we, as a Health and Human Services agency, stand behind every child, every adult, and every family in the community working to protect children. We want to assure that they are in safe and protected homes, that they do not have abuse, neglect, and violence in those homes. As a community, we actually look to the community to be the eyes and ears for those vulnerable children who don't always have the opportunity to speak for themselves. And so we ask that people call the number that was already given in order to make those reports when we need to. We also um, want to make sure that we just thank all of the Health and Human Services employees who are trying to assure the safety of children and protecting children every single day. And I'm honored to work with a qualified, wonderful staff that um, does that on a daily basis, not just in April. But thank you for making April this month where we're going to look to keep children safe. Thanks for all you do, ladies. Uh, Ms. Swanson, Hanson, Nielsen. We 
it's a team effort. We all got to pitch in. I wish it wasn't a, wasn't an issue for us, but it is, and we have to deal with it. So thank you. Okay. Next up, we have um, Commissioner Frost is going to give a presentation to Angela Kuhn about Parkinson Disease Awareness Month. Thank you for being here, Ms. Kuhn. You know, I just want to say before I read this how um, these are sad issues but isn't it great to be in a community that addresses them and this proclamation that we did before and the one now it's a call to action and I'm grateful that we can all do this County of Buncombe Parkinson uh, Proclamation of Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. Whereas Parkinson's disease is a progressive disorder of the central nervous system, the second most common neurodegenerative disease affecting an estimated 1.5 million people in the United States. And whereas Parkinson's disease is the 14th leading cause of death in the U.S. and no objective test or biomarker and no cure or drug to slow or halt the progression of the disease and whereas the estimated economic burden of Parkinson's disease has at least 14 billion annually including indirect costs to patients and families of 6.3 billion and whereas increased research education and community services are needed to find more effective treatments and to provide access to quality care <coughs> to those living with the disease today and whereas the board feels that a month should be set aside to promote awareness of this disease and improve the su support system for those with the disease, their families and caregivers. Now, th therefore, be it proclaimed, the Board of Commissioners for the County of Buncombe as follows. One, that April, April be proclaimed Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month in Buncombe County. Two, that this board recognizes the indispensable services of the Parkinson's Action Network and the Parkinson's Support Group of Asheville for their efforts to raise funds to help find a cure to promote awareness of this disease and to provide patient and family support to those fighting this disease. Three, that this proclamation be effective upon its adoption, adopted this seventh day of April 2012, Board of Buncombe County Commissioners, David Gant. Is there a motion for approval of the resolution? So I think that's a motion. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> also, all in favor, uh, opposed say no. Motion carries. Go ahead. Thank you. I would just like to say I am a Parkinson's advocate for the Parkinson's Action Network. I wrote an op-ed that appeared in the Friday paper and what I wanted you to imagine is being 35 years old, you've lost your sense of smell, you've lost your balance, and you're not exactly sure what's going on. That has happened across the board. Parkinson's affects people from age 20 on up. And now we have discovered that there is such a thing as infantile Parkinson's and children are being diagnosed as well. So we do need the support. We do need people to come out and really go after this neurodegenerative disease so that people can live productive lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angela. All right, next we have uh, start our public hearings we have a property acquisition ferry road dr green if you'll tell us about that mr chairman and commissioners tonight we're asking you to acquire and hold for resale property that's suitable for an economic development project as defined in north carolina general statutes 158-7.1 and these are the statutes that authorize and specify the requirements on economic development activity for counties in North Carolina. If approved, Buncombe County will pay $6,815,000 for 137.21 acres that are, that's owned by Henderson County. We refer to this as the Ferry Road site, but even though it's owned by Henderson County, it's located in Buncombe County just off of Brevard Road. In, a, in compliance with the interlocal agreement between Henderson County and the City of Asheville, along with a local bill that passed during a previous session of the General Assembly, the net cost to Buncombe County for this property will be $3,407,500. Now, this isn't the first time I've come to you and asked you to buy or approve um, a project prior to any announcement. 
Uh, I remember standing before you when we met down the road asking you to spend $7 million to buy a 400,000 square foot building. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, we couldn't tell the public why at that point in time. And it was, um, you know, people wondered, people wanted to know. But we were able just a few weeks later to announce that Lenamar was coming to our community. And today they have over a $300 million investment in our community. And uh, a significant number of people are working at that site that was vacant prior to this. GE was a similar invest, uh, situation where we had to get incentives approved before GE would sign any final documents to come to North Carolina. Those incentives in, involved four communities in North Carolina. It was a real balancing act, but today we have a $125 million investment. We've secured 336 jobs for the community, and we are the world headquarters for the certified ma uh, ceramic matrix composite for GE. Um, we are working with a prospect for the Ferry Road site. They're not as far along right now in the decision-making process as the projects that we brought you before. However, we ran into a, a little different problem than we've had before. Henderson County had an offer for this property, um, and they were going to accept that offer. It wasn't for as high use as a, 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 an economic development project would bring to us. So we have worked with this current client since February of 2014, and this is the only site they're considering in North Carolina. The land purchase is earlier in the evaluation process than previous projects. However, we do have more than one interested party as we move through this process. We have a second, uh, a backup offer on this. From a business perspective, looking at it strictly from business, there's a good return on investment on this property going forward. You know, I'm often asked, how do we lower the cost of government? And my answer is pretty simple. Uh, when you expand the tax base so there's more people to share the cost, and you put people to work so there's less need for our service, mm -hmm. you lower the cost of government. And I think these projects that we brought you in the past and that we will continue to bring you in the future give us that opportunity. The incentives that we offer businesses are not paid until we realize that revenue. If we offer a company a million dollar incentive for a specific investment, we wait until that, that investment is actually on the tax roll in the tax department. And we check that very thoroughly before we make any payment to the, to the company. And the jobs that they generate, the, the jobs that they uh, put in place generate wealth for the community. But we also check to make sure they've provided the jobs at the specified salary before we make those incentive payments. So we've realized the investment in the community and the investment in jobs before we make any payment. Um, the interlocal agreement that Henderson Asheville have uh, require that this property be used for economic development purposes and that an easement be provided for greenways. Buncombe County has a commission approved greenway master plan and the easements will be reflected in accordance with that plan. The interlocal agreement requires that the easements be in the City of Asheville's name. This is a multi-step process. In addition to your action, on uh, April 14th, Asheville will consider an action to confirm that the sale is in compliance with the interlocal agreement and release the reverter in the deed to Henderson County, and that's, that's significant and important to us. And on April 15th, Henderson County will formally approve sale of the property to another government entity per uh, North Carolina Gen General Statutes 160A 274. Now, Henderson considers the sale of this property to Buncombe the fulfillment of the terms of the interlocal agreement. We completed the environmental work when we offered this property to another client last year. We did extensive testing and the environmental reports show no concerns on the property. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have about any of the information I've provided or um, any, any um, questions that you might have overall on the project or the, that I can answer in the property transaction before we open the public hearing. Any questions, Dr. Green, prior to the public hearing? Uh, could you explain what reverter is? I heard that term, and I'm yes. Um, the interlocal agreement. This is a there. This is about, about a 20-year-old um, property transaction between the city of Asheville and Henderson County, and the the original documents required that the property re revert from Henderson County to Asheville if a sewage treatment plant was not built at a certain time. And certainly. Um, uh, Commissioners uh, Newman and Frost, uh, Jones know a whole lot more about this than I do, but basically the property would revert. There were a number of lawsuits and transactions around the property, and um, 
the property should have reverted to the city of Asheville July the 1st of 14. There was a local bill that we looked at this site, by the way, for a firing range, an outdoor firing range. It's bordered by an I-26, Brevard Road, and the river, and it was still a huge problem. And we had a lot of uh, feedback from people about noise in the community. Um, so a local bill was passed to say, you can sell this property, Henderson and Asheville, and you can split the proceeds, and both of you have to use it for public safety. And the interlocal agreement between Henderson and Asheville, Asheville will provide their half of the sales to us to use for public safety, and we'll use it on the firing range. Um, but it's important that the reverter clause be removed from the deed because it, it, is, it is a restriction in the deed, and we'll have to do that so that we have that property to move forward with the, uh, with the client. Okay, thank Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I have a question, Ms. Go Green. Ahead, ma um, you mentioned GE and Linamar, mm -hmm. um, the land purchases in those um, incentive packages. Mm -hmm. When the county purchased the land in each of those um, deals, did we have any sort of written commitment from those companies? We did have commitment from them, not final documents mm -hmm. uh, on the transaction, but we had commitment from them and we had announcement dates coming. Uh, we're not that far along with this project. Okay, so to clarify, um, when we were, when we had our closed session meeting, there was n no document or agreement from any company. There was no written agreement from any company. And I have to say that I did not take um, written agreements into, into cl any closed session on the other two projects either. I just okay. had those. Okay, so when, when um, the land was purchased, is this land acquisition at Ferry Road unique to you or to the county? We are uh, in the sense that we do not have the absolute commitment from the company. Okay. This is much earlier in the process okay. than and, that. And it's unique because we did have such commitment with the previous two companies in which we, the county purchased land. We did have, okay. yes, Thanks. commitment from the other two companies, yes. Any other questions for... Uh, just, yes. a, just a quick follow-up on that. Um, uh, I would also... Uh, identify some uniqueness in the uh, the fact that we already have a backup offer as well I mean has that been your I mean in, in kind of the buying and selling of uh, property that we've had uh, is that is that unusual that's also very unusual um, in a, but in a very positive way uh, yes. like I said from a business perspective this this is a good return on investment uh, the offer that Henderson County had they passed that along to us and I have been in contact with that that individual contacted me almost immediately uh, to make their offer to us and actually contacted me again last night. So their interest is still there. Uh, but I did tell them we're working the economic development project. So what we're referring to as backup offer was actually the entity that the county outbid. Is that the backup offer? The, it is the same company. It is the same uh, company that approached Henderson County, yes. Yeah, that's what we're calling. Okay, that is, is a backup. I mean, we do have a backup offer on that. Is the offer more or is it less? We, I will tell you, as I told uh, the gentleman who contacted me, the only way we can sell it is to put it up for upset bid at, at a price price, and a price price will be our purchase price. So they will have to come to our purchase price to buy it. That that's just general statute. But again. The reason why we went into closed session was for economic development reasons. Yes. It wasn't to speculate on property. It, and it was because no. there are the, there's the prospect of excellent jobs for our people <clears throat> out there. So this is just kind of a great plan B, so to speak. But we're going to go full head of steam and, and try to land these jobs. We sir, Yes, we are, very much so, and um, have meetings to continue that process. And like I said, we've been working with them for 13 months. Um, and I told the, the person who wants to make the backup offer, we'll pursue the uh, economic development project first. Um. I just want to have one clarification question. Uh, it's related to the reverter as well and that arrangement. So just to make sure I'm clear, <clears throat> the uh, $6.8 million price tag for the property, um, $3.4 million of that will go from will go to the, the city of Asheville, and then they will transfer that to Buncombe County. So um, we will get this property that's appraised at $6.8 million, and it'll only cost us $3.4 million net to 
for the county to acquire That's it. That's the net cost of the county. And if you look at the budget amendment we moved, we're showing paying out the 6.8 and re receiving revenue of 3.4. Thank you. Does this um, property represent some of the last industrial um, land for development? Uh, I mentioned, and I think it's safe and fair to mention uh, now, that we worked with a client last year and we pulled all the 100-acre sites in Buncombe County that were still vacant. This was by far the most attractive site to them also. They just made a, a corporate decision to go elsewhere. You, uh, this one is served with water and sewer. The others were not. Wanda, if we had not purchased when we did, what would happen to the project? Um, the project would have um, taken us off the off the considered sites. I mean, this is the only site in Buncombe they're interested in. But in, in North Carolina, was Henderson me. County going to vote to sell the property to the third uh, party? the day after the, our closed session? Okay, and so they were very clear with me; they were going to accept the offer. So the next day, the property would have been sold and taken out of possibility for economic development. It, we would have lost this client if we uh, hadn't done this. Uh, it. it the the sale was to um, not as attractive a, a purchaser as an industrial client. But um, if let me make a comment to see if this is accurate. But if they had sold that, then to our discussion about the you know, reverter, that that 3.4 million would have still had to go to the city of Asheville and be available for. Um, that money, the money way the would, interlocal money would have had to go to the city, <coughs> and then that money would have had to be used for, um, uh, you know, firing range or whatever public safety. Yeah. It would the, have to be used for public safety. It, right? it would. It, the circumstance would have been the same in terms of the flow of money. The offer was not at six point eight million. Right. So whatever it was, if mm -hmm. it was, you know, close mm -hmm. to that, then half of that would have had would have went to the city, and so that would have that still would have happened. It would have happened. I do have to say, and just I'll candor to everybody, uh, the client that is making the offer, there would have been a challenge to whether or not that met the intention of the interlocal agreement. So if, so then that diminishes the fact that this, cli this client is, is an iron ironclad second, secondary deal. It's, it's just, we're removing the, re when you, we are satisfying the terms of the interlocal agreement with this purchase. And then any, any transactions going forward will be totally in your discretion. Okay. Okay. Thanks. How, roughly, how many jobs <coughs> since you've been here have, have you uh, engineered economic development for, and, and what does that mean to the taxpayers? Um, you know, we just recently had to pull that information. One is I feel like I've been here a long time, so I can't re <laughs> recall some of the first years. But in the last five years, we've added 6,200 jobs and 989 million, basically a billion dollars worth of tax base. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? And I, I see Mr. Teague is here from Economic Development sitting in the back. If there's any questions there before we start the public comment. I'd also like to represent Representative Brian Turner is here. Thank you for, always good to see you. Thank you for your good work in Raleigh. Okay, if not, <coughs> then uh, thank you, Dr. Green. We'll start and we'll have, we'll have a chance to ask more questions or comments after the public hearing. Uh, I'll start the public hearing on the Ferry Road property acquisition at uh, 622. <coughs> uh, Mr. Yelton will start off. Uh, Anybody else want to be heard on the public uh, hearing? Mr. Rice, you'll be next. Anyone want to be heard after these two gentlemen? Yes, ma'am, in the back. And then uh, we'll have you, then you fourth. If y'all want to come on up and sit on the front row, that's fine. Why don't y'all do that, and then we'll get in order of uh, speaking. I think this public hearing shows the importance of closed meetings and open meetings, and the general statute says whatever goes on in a closed meeting after the time it's completed can be made public. It is very obvious here, one of the advantages of being a gray hair and having hair is uh, the fact that I can remember when the city of Asheville built a water plant in Hendersonville with an agreement to Henderson County to put a wastewater treatment plant in Asheville in that area. Because guess what? It does flow downhill, guys, and you know that here. So this whole thing came about because of that agreement. That's there. 
And if my figures are correct, Wanda, you just cut a deal that cut the price of that property per acre in half, basically, when you get the exchange of the money. Now, that is costing the residents of the city of Asheville, and there's two members of this board used to be <laughs> representatives for Asheville, so I think you need to go public with this whole thing, explain the whole thing, why you've done it, and it's a good deal. To me, it looks like a good deal because you're going to end up with that acreage, and if you don't have anybody to buy it, hold on to it. Now, sure, you have some floodplain out there. About 18 to 20 percent of it's floodplain. I've already looked at the map. But that's going to be in your greenway plan. You can put picnic benches down there, whatever, which might attract the company because they could use those during break time. So I think it is a good deal, and, and I'm glad to see that happen, but I'm telling you, that what you need to do from this point forth, Wanda, is anything in the closed meeting, once it's satisfied, I don't care if it's a lawsuit, whatever, go public with it because you will prove that your actions in the closed meeting were proper and you will build trust between you and the citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yelton. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. The word industrial means something to me that might not mean to most people. <clears throat> and if you saw the presentation at AB Tech yesterday, you'll find out that the industrial community in our <clears throat> place is so small that it's hardly seen. But the word industrial to me brings about things in the community that is not pleasant. You go out in Candler community and you're going to see the APEC. You're going to see contamination of all sorts, and this is industrial. We have got community out in Inca on AB Tech site that's contaminated, but it's an industrial site. What did we do? We went and built a school out there, or planning to build one. They ain't got the foundation out that good yet. So are you going to turn your industrial land into something else? Or what is the real plan? Because the school ain't industrial. Why did we use industrial park to create our school? That don't make sense. If we're that bad, you know, about jobs. Buying this 137 acres is a lot of land. And it's a lot of waterfront. So I'm concerned about not the contamination that might be there now. I ain't seen nothing that tells me they ain't. But what is it that's going there or potential? And I'll tell you what, I think personally you need to let the community decide on who's buying property, not commissioners. You shouldn't be in the real estate business anyway. Private developers can make much more and you can restrict them on what they can do. But don't be the investor and the one that's buying the property. This is a statewide problem. This Lenamar stuff ain't as pretty as what you are making out to be. The biggest portion of this money is in machinery. And these jobs is not going to be what you think you're going to be. Because I got customers that works there now. And it certainly ain't as pretty as what you are telling me. You just need to invest in the thinking and let the community do the walking and talking. Young commissioners need to be about public safety and a public way of health and things of that nature. You just need to get out of the real estate business. This property out here, 137 acres, is beautiful property. But private sector people knows how to work and make a living and make jobs affordable here. We are on the opposite end. When you're talking about jobs, you can forget it in Buncombe County. You ain't going to get good paying jobs here. You are a tourist town. Tourist town does not attract good paying jobs. That's about as blunt and short as I can. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yes, sir. And who wants to be heard after this gentleman? Yes, ma'am. I think I had you first. Sorry we took you out of order there. Come on up, uh, ma'am. My name is Mike Bowman, and I'm a property owner in Buncombe County on Ferry Road. This 137 acres is right in my backyard. And I just wonder about the proximity of this firing range to my dwelling. Uh, where it's going to be located and understand Greenway through the the property. Uh, I was a businessman, a business owner in Buncombe County for years and sold a business a few years back. I 
own a small business nowadays, but <clears throat> just I just wonder, you know, the proximity of this to my house, if there'll be, which I know it won't be there, because the better part of this property is right behind my house, the the best laying part of it, and uh, just industrial development, what will be in my backyard. I've lived out here, I've owned this property about five years now, and uh, beautiful place, lots of wildlife, lots of habitat. Just hate to see that get ruined, but I understand growth in the community, jobs, and uh, people people need a place to work, mm -hmm. a place to go. But I just wonder what sort of uh, buffer zone might be behind my property, because that property, when Henderson County bought it, the city of Asheville annexed it, day two, I guess. It doesn't touch the city anywhere around there, but it's city property, it's city of Asheville property. Because when I bought my house, I was in the ETJ. I came to planning and zoning, I was doing some remodeling. And they said, you're in the city. I said, no, I'm not. Hmm. I was born and raised out in that part of the world and worked there forever. And so I was speaking with this lady and she pulls up an overhead map shows all this grid work on her. She says, well, you will soon be annexed. I said, well, I don't want that because where my property line is, I have grass and the trees is not my property. And the trees is the city of Asheville and I'm a Buncombe County resident. And I just wonder, you know, just looking, I mean, I, I know I can't stop it unless they'll take a check for it. I can write a check, but <laughs> I don't think I could back it up. <laughs> <laughs> but I just hate to see, uh, you know, I'm just in, in my part, it's my backyard, and I hate to see it get gone. But I understand growth, industry, jobs, and and the community. And if this is just going to be a, an outdoor firing range, what uh, sort of hours of operation, if it's going to be like that, they're probably doing night training because it's for the uh, law enforcement personnel and everything they do it in daylight. Just startling folks, you know. I'm a hunter. Shooter and National Rifle Association member, life member, and uh, just looking forward to what's coming. Mr. Bone, I will tell you, and it's public hearing, but we're we're not considering a firing range, shooting range there. That that's not one of the, that's not being considered. So that well, will be it. There is a undisclosed project we are considering. <coughs> well, that's that what all be, the the talk has been about a firing range in that. That's part. actually at another site um, we're looking at. That's that's at the. Um, uh, the old Wouldn't landfill. Looking out there? The yeah, we're not, there, that's not being considered. Okay, well, that's so the just, fire range isn't, there is something we are, we're not at liberty to discuss that might be. Okay. And I think that there may have just been a little confusion when the county manager spoke earlier. That was a property that was looked at when we were looking at different outdoor firing range options, but it was dropped from consideration due to concerns right. about, about noise pollution in that area. So that's no longer a possibility. It won't be considered for an outdoor firing range or indoor firing range, but for an economic development project. I'm say if there's a fire range, I just like to be able to shoot too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you very much. much. Yes, ma'am. Betty Jackson, once again from Buncombe County. Um, I know that 6.8 million or 3.4 million might just seem like chump change to people like you because we're half a billion dollars in debt in the county, but it doesn't seem like chump change to me. Um, are my neighbors and there's something that I just don't get here that was said earlier that if the county doesn't buy this property this company won't come there why wouldn't they go there if it belonged to Henderson County I mean the land is the same what's different there, there's just some things that don't make sense to me um, so if you could clarify that I, I would appreciate it very much um, I also am a person that doesn't believe that uh, county government needs to be in the real estate business because I don't think that's a legitimate function of government. And I'd just like to say something about the concept of economic multipliers. Um, <coughs> it's a macroeconomic theory that has been debunked. It's a myth that you can take money from the taxpayer and give it to some development that will include that and that that will improve the economy because you can't possibly know and you can't possibly predict how money taken from the taxpayer would have been spent in the local economy otherwise and it's never been proved that any increased benefit to the local economy actually has ever existed anywhere by this kind of spending um, it sounds good and it is a theory but it has been debunked because when you choose to take money out of circulation and give it 
to company X or Y or to create certain amount of jobs, it takes that money out of circulation that might have gone to companies A, B, C, D and those jobs. Uh, and it's not just a shell game because every doc dollar that's taken out in the form of taxes also has to, fear to be filtered through bureaucratic channels that first siphon off a significant percentage into bureaucratic functions and the full 100% is really never returned to the economy. Um, so really what you have is a negative multiplier. Um, you might recall that story about Chiquita Banana that left Charlotte not too long ago after having received state and local funds there. Well, they promised to pay back the incentive money that they got, but they'll never get the 100% back. And then where are the jobs? And I really think this ought to be a lesson to everybody in this room that government can't predict the future. You think you know that it's going to bring jobs and it's going to bring this kind of greatness to the county, but you can't predict that. The money is better spent in the private sector and letting people decide what goes on. Also, that this started happening behind closed doors really, is, I, I think, is wrong. I think you need to have a bigger public comment period than just tonight. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Anybody else want to? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Greens. Anybody want to be heard after this lady? All right, come right up, ma'am. Well, one of the questions that I where are you from? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Gail Kronowski, and um, I live in uh, near the Woodfin training facility, as I stated earlier. One of the things that has concerned me as I've seen this transaction unfold is it seems that somehow Asheville's putting this money, this $3.4 million, into <coughs> public safety is somehow tied to a commitment to putting the, the, to their gaining access to the indoor firing range. And I find that very frustrating, again, because I live right by that area, by, right by the training facility. And so now not only is that a Buncombe County issue, now you have the Asheville, you have Asheville involved in it. And how does that change all of the, di di all of the dynamics that have been in place when it was just Buncombe County. And again, I think this all needs to be put out into the public so we understand exactly what that means to us. Because now you're bringing Asheville in, that's you know more hours of operation, more traffic, more noise pollution, and yet you will you will not put the, the the firing range somewhere because else because of noise pollution but now you're going to be tr looking at bringing it to a residential area adjoining a residential area that has a high echo and we're not even being included in the planning and i find that very frustrating and i just don't think it's the way that this that business should be done thank you thank you Ms. pronouncing any other public comment on this issue If none, I'll declare the public hearing closed at 636. Comments, questions on the uh, <coughs> proposal to buy the Ferry Road property for $6.8 million. I have a one more question. I yes, one more, I think. Um, Ms. Green, will you just explain exactly where in the tr um, transaction process we are? Because I think sometimes we refer to it as already purchased is the land uh, yeah. explain have um, we purchased the land or not no we're asking you to not to approve purchase of the land it's still subject to approval um, by the city of Asheville to say that the this sale uh, satisfies the interlocal agreement and Henderson County has to take action to actually sell the property um, you know no matter when you go into closed session whatever you do has to come out and be approved in public and we're in the process of the public approvals by both Henderson and Buckham so what have we done um, in coordination with Henderson County uh, we've based off of what happened in closed session uh, we've uh, we've told them we want to purchase the land they um, 
they have agreed that they'd like to sell the land and for a appraised price, and that's what uh, what we agreed to pay. Um, they, it's all subject to final approval by the Board of Commissioners both in both counties. And in this one, it's a, a little more complicated in that there is the interlocal agreement, and we have to determine that everybody's satisfied that that's been met, too. So um, your action tonight, if you approve this, will be to say Buncombe County can buy this property for $6.8 million. And uh, the Henderson County's action will be that they will sell it for that on the 15th. Asheville's action is just to say it complies with the interlocal and they'll remove the reverter clause. <clears throat> we started this process a couple weeks ago in, in closed session. Um, and I just want to be sure that between the closed session and today, there is still no written agreement with any company. No, there there isn't a written agreement yet, um, and we'll. Uh, I mean, we've worked on draft documents for the sale, but they're just draft at this <coughs> point until y'all approve moving forward. We could not take any action in closed session. We can't you vote can't. closed mm -hmm. session. We can only give directives. And, um, but you're referring to the the business, the the economic development client. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there any other comments or questions? I'd like to make a motion that we purchase a property on Ferry Road. Second. There's been a motion by Commissioner Frost, a second by <coughs> Commissioner Newman. Is there and any I'm, further discussion? Yeah, I'd like to just make a couple of comments. The, um, you know, I think that I appreciate the presentation. I appreciate the comments. You know, this is, um, <coughs> you know, and I understand, I appreciate the concerns that have been raised about this initiative and the project. I mean, it's, it's a project where, you know, the outcome is not certain. You know, there's, there's no guarantee that this is going to, the economic development project that's of particular focus right now is going to happen. So that, I think we go into this with our eyes wide open on that and re recognize that that's a, you know, that's, um, you know, that's a distinct possibility. And, um, but we've got a great team working on it and we know that they are, um, we are, we are definitely in the hunt for what would be one of the most significant economic development projects in Western North Carolina in the last several decades. So it's a, uh, the, there's not a sure thing, um, but the potential for um, a major economic development project in our community is very real. And uh, in terms of the, um, we can't obviously go into a lot of detail about this because it is a conf confidential <coughs> economic development negotiation process that the company is going through in terms of looking at their locations. but. Um, you know, I think it's the kind of project, like some of the other big economic development projects like GE and Linamar have been mentioned. And, um, you know, it, this would be another um, great um, business partner to have in our community. These would be um, living wage jobs, jobs that support middle class families um, for, for decades to come. This is going to be the kind of project that will be here for, for years and years and decades to come if we are successful. And there'll be clean. And there'll be clean jobs too. It'll be clean industry, uh, a great asset for the community. So, um, and and in the worst case scenario, if the project, uh, if this company decides not to locate in in our community, goes somewhere else, uh, the worst case scenario is that we will have acquired a six point eight million dollar uh, piece of real estate for at a cost of three point four million dollars to Buncombe County taxpayers. And it, it will be a. It is a beautiful piece of property. Um, the uh, and it does pr create opportunities for some of the recreational uh, amenities that have been described along the French Broad River, and uh, it'll be a valuable asset to Buncombe County one way or the other if this particular project doesn't come to pass. So for all those reasons, I'm happy to second the motion. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Just could I make one point? There are actually three parts to this. The resolution to purchase, the reimbursement resolution, should we decide to use that at a future date, you have to pass it now, and then the budget am amendment that was moved up from closed session. So it's three parts. So do we... I mean, from uh, pre -session. Do this one and then go to the next one, or can we do it all in one? I think you can do it all in one. All right. Any other comments? Yeah. <laughs> yes, Commissioner. Go ahead. I looked at uh, I looked at this in a in a form that we supposedly was talking about a 13 month deal, but this deal came forward in about three days. I'd heard something in a closed session about another deal with another property, but I've never heard about this one. At about 5.30 in the morning, I asked Ms. Green, because when she had emailed us, I called her and asked her, if these people are serious and they're going to spend the kind of money that they're talking about, 
would they put up $680,000? Earnest money. They could taken it off if they took it, or we got to keep it if they didn't. That's, that's all I asked, anybody that's serious in something. We just lost a deal with the aviation thing at the airport, so there's no jobs. We were number two on the list. Uh, Sir, I think it's Cirrus Airplanes or something like that Sir. that was going to the airport. We lost it to Knoxville. So who says, you know, this is the county taxpayer's dollars? And that's always something I've always said that I want to try to watch. This may be a good deal. It may be a great deal. But the whole deal is thrown together in a 15-minute process, and I've never been able to do that. And, Mr. Gant, we said we didn't vote when we went into closed session. Might not have been a vote, but it's a bunch of nod heads. And, you know, there was four on one side that nodded ahead and four on the other side that nodded ahead. So I can still – that was kind of like uh, – what happened back with uh, Mr. Reisinger when people called in uh, or text, then uh, our attorney said that, you know, that was actually a vote then. So uh, I don't know how that would be different than today, that, that this, what happened in this session for economic development turned into a property buy that we don't know if they're coming or they're not coming. It might be a good deal, but it might not be a good deal. But, it, you know, everybody said, well, it's beautiful property. Well, if you're going to put a business on it, it don't have to be beautiful. Uh, you know, it's just the acreage. And the simple fact is, is we walked in a room talking economics. Uh, would I bet my job on them, them coming here today? No. That's where I'm at. Anybody else on this board, I'd be more than happy to see if you would be more than happy to bet your job today on this group coming. That's where I'm at. I want all of it that we can get. I want everybody to have a job, but I want people, you know, I hear, you know, you hear you end up one and two in, in the line on these things. We're one, two, three, or four. We don't know exactly where we're at because we're competing with other states. We have just going to buy some property and all that's going to do is give this company leverage to come in and want more incentives and let's give them the property that's exactly what we're doing tonight and so if that's what y'all want to do go for it mr deutsch would you address that about the vote there's a question he had whether he felt it was a vote did you see you were at the meeting we had um did you see any procedural or any violations of the uh, closed session law? Um, no, I didn't. Uh, the, uh, it was a uh, discussion uh, in, in order to give direction to the county, uh, the, uh, the county manager. And um, uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, the documents and the discussion with Henderson County expressly uh, stated that, that all this was subject to uh, public session approval and vote uh, by the, uh, the, uh, the commissioners. So uh, I thought it was a good, uh, thorough discussion. I thought everybody uh, expressed their, uh, their views, which, you know, uh, everyone was not in agreement, but it was not a vote. All right, so thank you. Any other From comments? a legal point Can, of view. May I ask another question? Yes, sir, certainly. To the attorney, please. If it had been, say, five to two and opposite, where would we have done that? The, we would that would have not instructed Miss Green to go to Henderson County to try to do this. If if it had been an area where it says so that I consider as being, you know, if it was four to three, that con, that's considered in my eyes a vote to, for her to go to, to Henderson County with the offer to purchase. If it had been opposite, no, then four to three on a no, that would have said not for her to go try to purchase the property. That's so I consider any any nods or something like that that considers the option that she can go or whoever can go to <coughs> try to purchase something. And in the one day deal, we had one day for her to be able to do this and the nods were there for her to do it. That 
that's the only problem that I see. When Mr. Reisinger, we did the deal and kept him open two more hours and we didn't have the numbers up here, that was a vote. And you said it was a vote on that particular deal. So this was basically in the back room. <clears throat> We're not discussing who it is or what it is, but the facts are this was done in just a short period of time and there was enough votes to get or discussion of enough people to get Miss Green to talk to Henderson County. It was if it's the opposite direction, then it would she would not have. So I still consider that as a vote. You want me to respond? Yeah. So I think you're uh, I uh, completely get what you're saying when the uh, uh, the county manager is uh, considering whether to go to Henderson County and to uh, tell them that we're interested to buy, uh, buy the property subject to the vote and the, uh, uh, the process if she thinks that uh, five of the commissioners uh, do not approve of this I very seriously doubt that she would go to Henderson County because she wouldn't be able to get the type of approval that you're asked for uh, you know that they're asking for tonight and uh, just to clarify one thing with the uh, the register of deeds I don't want to come back into this but I actually said that was not a meeting because it was not the majority of the commissioners but I completely get what you're saying you're saying that you consider it tantamount to a vote uh, I'm responding as the lawyer about whether it actually is a vote under the law which uh, as one of the other commissioners tonight you know said that that uh, uh, the uh, the way I look at it as a lawyer is uh, is technical under the statute uh, and the way you as elected commissioners look at it might be a little bit different are right, any other comments or questions I I have one more ahead, question I, I'm sorry go, go ahead um, please. just along the lines of the the votes um, is are there any notes about which people or are there any notes that say how each individual responded in, to lead a discussion or a directive I, I, I'm just curious well, we're going to take that up with your motion but the answer is the <coughs> as I understand it the notes are narratives they're not verbatim we're going to discuss that later on tonight um, but no, and it doesn't need. It, it should be. Uh, With Madam all Clerk, due respect, let, I'm let not Madam sure Clerk that it's related. Madam Clerk, go ahead. What, this would, do you have my question. Interestingly, no. Okay. Yeah. 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 Interestingly enough, in this case, yes, there are notes that say. I don't think it's on. So Normally, no. no, because it is a narrative. Uh, but in this case, yes. Okay. Thank you. She said, in this particular case, there are notes. Uh, it was, it, it's required to be done in narrative, not required, but it, it's, it's optional with clerk, I believe, narrative. Uh, and we're going to take that up later on, a, a further discussion about how to take notes and how that works. But at this point, uh, there are notes about what it is. And, and frankly, after the economic development uh, is, is decided one way or the other, uh, anybody can say anything they want to. Um, they can get on uh, YouTube and they can mm -hmm. they can get on TV. They can hold a news conference and say whatever they want to after this is finished. So any commissioner always has that right. Okay. The, any other comments from the board? Yeah, I've got a. I got a yes, sir. Go I ahead, got a brief Bo comment. Vice Chair. Um, so I, I want to I want to be clear about. Um, you know, one is discussion regarding going to the different places and doing. There's, there's no question that, that Ms. Green does a fantastic job in, in following that direction. Um, uh, I, I'll be voting no uh, tonight. Um, but, uh, I was, I was a, and I think I can say this, I, w I, was, I was a no in the room. And uh, I was uncomfortable with, um, with, with the process and the speed and uh, of uh, uh, of it all uh, I also have a litmus test for me I don't think personally that I would do this uh, myself so because of that uh, reason uh, and and some others I, I'll be voting no tonight thank you all right any other comments or questions I have one folks this is a five-way win for us 
five ways we're going to win. We're going to come out ahead. Number one, we remain in contention for a major economic development project. If we hadn't done this when we did it, we're out of the game. We're out. We don't have a chance. Zero possibility of landing this job. Okay? Number two, if we don't get the business and they decide somewhere else, we retain a property that we can sell and we will get, um, we have a backup, which is very unique. I don't remember it ever happening that we had a backup, so you, you basically have a seller lined up that wants it if we don't do the economic project. <coughs> Number three, we receive $3.4 million from the city of Asheville, as Commissioner Newman said, toward our, our purchase price, and we can use, it's earmarked toward law enforcement, which will be the shooting range. <coughs> Number four, we bring this shooting range we've talked about for 15 years closer to reality because we have money toward it and um, we're moving that way. And number five, we resolve a decades old dispute between Hendersonville, Henderson County and Asheville. Now that's not what we're here about, but what a great side effect as a regional partner to, to resolve this issue that's been a bone of contention for decades. This property's been tied up with that reverter. Nobody would touch it. No business would touch it. Nobody's going to get into the middle of that mess. So we get it free title to do what we want to with it. So in my opinion, we win five ways. We, we can't tell you what's going to happen. I wish we could tell the gentleman that lived next door what's going to happen here. Uh, it will depend on things beyond our control that we can't talk about. I wish we could talk about it. Boy, that would make our life a lot easier, <laughs> but we can't because they have reasons, and I think they're sound business reasons, why these things will remain confidential because they don't want people jacking the price up. They don't want speculation that, that runs them away from where they're going. So there are reasons for doing that. That's the way it's done, but we're a player here. We have a chance, and we can't guarantee it's going to happen. Our, 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 our commissioners that say it's not a sure thing are exactly right. There is no guarantee here. But folks, at the end of the day, if we get this, or whether we don't get this, we've been responsible. And it did come up fast. I wish Henderson County hadn't want to sell it the next day. I wish they had said, give us more time. But you know, they wanted to unload it. They'd had it for how long? 12 years. 20 years. They wanted to get rid of it. I don't blame them. And they wanted to sell it for whatever they get on it. Paying them actual taxes. All right. So. Mr. Chairman. That's where I, I go. Make one more. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I want to just end where I started in. If you look at the leadership of Buncombe County, it's been bold, it's been progressive, and if you look at the state of Buncombe County compared to other counties, we are far ahead because of the leadership team we have between Dr. Green, Mr. John Creighton, EDC, and is this perfect? No. Do we have more problems to fix in Buncombe County? Of course we do. But we are not going to get anywhere if we run scared and don't do everything we can to get really good jobs. Okay, any other comments? I'm ready to vote for jobs. <laughs> yep. All right. All right, there, I'll take that as a motion <laughs> call a question. Now we have three resolutions. We can do these all at the same time. There's a resolution to buy the property. There's a reimbursement resolution that basically approves, earmarks the money and it will be spent as, as it's required. And then there's a budget amendment. And I suppose um, we sh we'll do the line item and then we'll do the rest of the items in the capital because they were actually, or can we do it all at once? You approve the rest of the capital items. We only moved, ah, okay. moved out the. So this is on the line road. item for this purchase. Okay. There's very two, good. one to buy and one to receive the money from Ashley. All right. Does everybody understand? So they, basically this is to do all the legalities and all the procedures we're required by law to do to buy this property from Henderson County for $6.8 million. And then all the other things will flow and then we'll see what happens with the economic development. Do I need to change my motion or is that, can that be? If, that, I'll, if you'll take that as a friendly amendment, yeah. you too, that yeah. we'll, we'll do it according to the procedure that is outlined, uh, as I, I mentioned. Okay. Is that sufficient legally to lead? Yeah, okay. I, 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 second I, I, second I, I, again I with the, okay. the amendment, friendly amendment. All right. So there's been a motion and a second <coughs> to buy reimbursement resolution and to do a budget uh, line amendment in capital projects. Everybody understand? Any questions? All right. Then I'll call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. 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 
the motion passes four to three Belcher De Brule and Fryer against am I is that correct okay now now I'll try to find my agenda rezoning I'll take your yes okay rezoning uh, mr. Jones uh, r3 to CS 31 Monticello Road mr. O'Connor will tell us about that one Josh Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so the rezoning that you have before you tonight is case number ZPH 2014-00082. Uh, the request is to go from R3 to CS, uh, which is commercial service zoning. Um, and the property is at 31 Monticello Road. Um, and it's a portion of tax lot pin number 97431375 um, you've performed several other rezonings in the nearby vicinity. Um, this application was actually put in um, conjunction with another rezoning that you've recently approved. Uh, but during the public portion comment of the uh, planning board hearing, um, the applicant revised their, their application uh, to remove some of the steeper portions of the property from the rezoning request um, and only have the uh, larger portion of the road frontage uh, as commercial service. Um, staff has recommended this rezoning for approval, um, being that the property is within a transportation corridor as identified on the 2013 update to the Buncombe County Land Use Plan. Uh, the portions of the property in question are not within high elevations um, and it's not within a flood hazard area. And I've got the, the property there uh, for you to review. And as I said, this is not um, actually the, the entire property. Um, on kind of the northwestern boundary, the, the property does continue, and that's been excluded from this rezoning because there were some, some terrain issues there. Um, Planning Board recommended the revised mm -hmm. request uh, unanimously, and um, the public comment we received at the second hearing after the request was revised. Um, did not have the, the same issues that we heard at the first hearing. So with that, I can answer any questions that you might have. Any question for Mr. O'Connor before we have our public hearing in the matter? Thank you. I will declare the public hearing open at uh, 6.59. Any members of the public wish to be heard about the um, zoning uh, rezoning request, Mr. Jones, uh, R3, S1, Monticello Road. If none, I will declare the public hearing closed at 7 o'clock. Is there a motion or discussion? Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Commissioner Fryer. Is there a second? I'll second it and find that, it's, that the request is consistent with the county comprehensive land use plan, reasonable and in public interest. Perfect. Very good. That agreeable, friendly amendment there, Commissioner Fryer? Yes. Okay. I guess, yeah, First one second. second. Okay, second, second again. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, there's a motion second. Is there any further questions or discussion? None. I call the question. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Then the rezoning request is granted a seven to zero vote. Thank you. Question? Sir. Sorry. Yes. Do, yep. Uh, yep. do we have to do two? Um, didn't we do multiple uh, the, the last time? Didn't we have to do another one for? The resolution of consistency didn't we have to do one for the ordinance and then one for the resolution of consistency there's, or am i confused there's actually two resolutions and the fact that you that you made that additional statement that it was in conformance with the land use plan um, is sufficient to to cover that requirement okay. we just need some acknowledgement that it is in in fact okay. in compliance thank you all right i will at request of commissioners take a eight minute break let's be back here at 7 10. Hey. <laughs> Hey, uh, when you come back, yes. you'll wear my jacket. Too. Well, no, I have this on my leg. You can wear my jacket. Uh, okay, I'll turn it up uh -huh. over here while I'll turn it up.